Sometimes one little millimeter can make all the difference. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, welcome back to OG's Danger Show. I'm an unapologetic Smith & Wesson M&P fan. I was issued my first M&P in 2017 when my agency switched from the stainless steel Generation 3 Smith 4006 to the Generation 1 Smith & Wesson M&P 40. At the instructor course, I shot so well with my new Smith that I quickly went out and bought my own M&P pistols in 45 and 9mm. I now own quite a few M&P pistols and they get carried about as much as my beloved Glocks. One product that we Smith & Wesson fans have been shouting for since the beginning of the line was a large frame M&P in the all-powerful, glorious, soul-crushing 10mm. I've carried 10mm for quite a few years now, mostly when I'm backpacking in the high country where the threat of surly animals far outweighs the threat of surly felons. It's become a favorite of mine on the flatland as well, where those surly felons might be wearing thicker clothing like leather biker jackets or puffy raiders jackets. But as we all know, the Glock 20 is one thick, bulky pistol. Grabbing onto it is like grabbing onto Rosie O'Donnell's ankles, and why anyone would be doing that is beyond me. While the Glock 20 has been a great trail and campsite companion, I and other Smith & Wesson fans have been wondering for years why they couldn't take their large size M&P 45 frame and beef it up to handle the hydrogen bomb that is the 10 millimeter round. At least the real 10 millimeter rounds. Well, last month Smith & Wesson finally heard us wailing into the night and they released their new M&P 10 millimeter. Don't confuse this with the M&P 10, that's a 308 caliber rifle, but the M&P 10 millimeter pistol. These new pistols come in the typical 4.6 inch frame and the shortened 4 inch frame just like their 45 caliber older brothers. I have the 4.6 inch M&P 45 and I love the damn thing. I even made a video about how to carry it in an appendix rig made by Vetter Holsters. If you haven't seen that gem of a video, wait until this one is over, then grab a cigarette and a Gatorade and go watch it before doing anything else today. Hell, you're most likely on the toilet right now anyway, so you've got plenty of time to watch both videos. By the way, reach behind you and give us a courtesy flush, will you? As soon as I heard the news about Smith & Wesson coming out with this new 10mm, I broke several traffic laws getting to my dealer's shop, only to find out that none of his distributors could get their hands on one. These pistols were that popular. I eventually lowered myself to ooching around in the urine-scented back alley that is gunbroker.com. Yeah, I was that desperate to get my hands on one of these new pistols. Don't even ask me what I had to do there to secure one of these. By the way, does anyone have a breath mint? Smith announced that these pistols would MSRP in the mid $600 range, and I was lucky enough to find one eh, higher than that. But if you're not first, you're last. The M&P 10mm that I found was the 4.6 inch model. They had both models, but I chose this over the 4 inch model because my 45 is the same exact size, and I wanted all my holsters to be interchangeable. And I figured this wasn't ever going to be a small, deep concealment gun for me, so I might as well get the full length barrel to take advantage of that extra 0.6 inches of barrel length and the ever so slight increase in 10 millimeter velocity. The one I chose was advertised as having no safety, 
something I consider mandatory these days since my dainty hands have a way of activating any manual safety at all the wrong times. Well, just like one would expect from Gun Broker, the pistol arrived with a safety. I thought I could live with it, but once again, I proved that having the hands the size of catcher's mitts made drawing and shooting the M&P 10mm difficult without accidentally activating that safety. And you know, the day I needed that pistol, as I was being raped by a cougar, Call me. <laughs> the fuzzy mountain kind with claws and sharp teeth, I wouldn't be able to get that safety off, and I'd end up eaten by a big cat and pooped out as some kind of a nasty civet coffee in some remote canyon of the High Sierras. It was an effortless project to find some of those little black frame safety plugs on eBay, and when they arrived, I had that safety removed faster than a rabbit humping a football. Now, my M&P 10 millimeter was just about perfect. Wait, what's that weird shaped panel on the top of the slide? Well, Smith & Wesson offers this pistol optics ready like all of their core pistols with a removable polymer plate that comes off quickly and allows the mounting of just about any red or green optic that your little blurry eyes could desire. I just happen to have a Holosun 507C with a green dot sitting around and I thought, what better place to install it than on this 10 millimeter beast of a pistol. The Smith & Wesson 10 comes with quite a few thin plastic mounting plates and one thin anodized aluminum one right there in the box. Now some people have bitched about the plates being plastic, but this didn't really bother me. I trusted that Smith & Wesson knew what they were doing. I'm the trusting type and maybe a little bit too much. One day I'll probably end up duct taped in the back of a carpeted van on my way to an auction in Saudi Arabia. What? It could happen. Here's the truly badass part. Smith & Wesson ships this new 10mm pistol with suppressor height sights for use with a red dot optic. That's right. You don't have to buy a set of aftermarket sights to work with your optic. This saves you about $100 right off the bat. These taller sights are easy to use even if you don't have an optic or don't plan on ever putting one on your gun. This was a brilliant move by Smith & Wesson and makes it clear that red dot guns are kind of the way things are headed despite how much us FUDs have dug in and tried to deny the trend. As you can clearly see here, it was easy to co-witness the sights right through the optics glass. If the battery ever dies or if the optic is shattered somehow, the pistol is still very usable. Use your knife or a multi-tool and punch out that broken glass and you're back in the fight with sturdy steel three dot sights. So a few of the reviews I'd seen on the M&P pistol that had hollow sun optics mounted on top ended up with one of the mounting screws shearing off under the 10 millimeter recoil and the optic taking a lover's leap off the top of the reviewer's gun. This obviously isn't the fault of Smith & Wesson. It's not the gun, it's the mounting screws that were supplied by Holosun. People are quick to blame Smith & Wesson because of the thin plastic mounting plates though, but it's very clear when you mount your optic that the mounting screws tap through those plastic plates and directly into the steel of the Smith & Wesson slide. These plastic mounting plates are more like a thin gasket or kind of like an adapter that allow a variety of optics to interface with the slide, providing little plastic lugs that snap into the bottom of whatever optic you choose. I recently had great luck putting a Holosun 507C red dot on a Glock 17, so this time I ordered the same optic but with a green dot, since scientists and wizards say the green dot is easier to pick up with the human eye. Once I found the right adapter plate, the hollow sun went on as easy as chocolate pie, and now I've shot about three or four hundred rounds of mixed 10 millimeter through the gun, and the optic is still with me and still mounted tight. The Smith & Wesson 10 millimeter isn't a tiny gun. It's not supposed to be. This is a hunting or backwoods gun. It can be easily carried concealed, as long as you have a decent cover garment that hangs low enough, but that's not really the purpose of this fistful of hate. It has almost the exact same front to back dimensions as my Glock 20, but the width is noticeably thinner than the Glock 20, which looks a lot like the deck of an aircraft carrier when you're looking down the sights. I used the new calipers that Mrs. OG gave me at Christmas and measured the widest part of this Smith & Wesson 10mm pistol right here above the frame at just a little bit over 1 inch. 1.1 inches is what I kept coming up with. The new M&P 10mm isn't much bigger than my Glock 17, but having all those extra foot-pounds of energy stacked up in the magazine is a big bonus. 
The pistol stands a proud 5.6 inches tall and my 4.6 inch barreled model ends up being 7.9 inches long from the tip of the barrel to the back of the grip. It's advertised as weighing 29.3 ounces empty, but I weighed mine after the Holosun was mounted without a magazine and came up with 27.8 ounces and 40.6 ounces with a full magazine of 15 rounds and the one chambered round sitting there for good measure. I've carried this monster for the better part of a month now, and a sturdy gun belt is imperative to a comfortable day with the gun on your side. While we're talking about carrying, Vetter Holsters in Ocala, Florida has recently signed on to sponsor OG's Danger Show. Can you believe that shit? We'll talk about that more later. But in my Shark Tank style negotiations with the guys at Vetter, I asked them to make me a Kydex rig for the M&P with an optic cut as well as a double magazine pouch in a matching color, even though I only have one spare magazine for this pistol right now. I was truly impressed with the gear they sent. This heavy duty Kydex holster secures the big M&P 10 millimeter tight to my side, even after a day of lugging this thing all over creation. Vetter Holsters also sent me one of their new Cobra gun belts and I haven't used this thing extensively. I've been wearing my Vetter holster so far with my next belt, but I plan on running this Cobra belt real soon and I'll give you a fair evaluation coming up. As you would expect, the pistol snaps in nice and snug and there's no wiggling or rattling around. The matching gray double magazine pouch allows me to carry 46 total rounds of powerful 10 millimeter on my person once I get that additional magazine. For now, a multi-tool slides in that open magazine pouch and allows me one spare magazine and a multi-tool. Gangsters, if you are looking for quality Kydex carry gear that is reasonably priced, that's not as expensive as your damn gun, use the affiliate link that I put in the description section right below this video and tell Vetter Holsters you want what OG has. You know I genuinely like their stuff before they even approached me because I raved about it in a video that I made on the Smith & Wesson m and 45 about a year ago. It's good quality stuff, and I used it a long time before they even contacted me. You've probably noticed the new style, mostly straight, trigger on the new m and 10 with a little trigger safety that all the cool guys are calling a dingus. This trigger is just a larger version of the flat face trigger that came on my Shield 9 Plus last spring. And I think it's a huge improvement over the hinged, curved trigger that the original Smiths had. There's even a built-in over-travel stop molded to the frame. Smith & Wesson advertises the trigger pull weight of the M&P 10mm as 5.5 pounds, but try as I might, I could never get more than 3 pounds 8 ounces with my Lyman digital trigger pull gauge. The average of three trigger pulls was 3.35 pounds. But don't go thinking this is some type of hair trigger. It has a very definitive two stages and the travel can be taken up and the trigger staged against the wall without any fear of breaking the sear and firing around. When the trigger is pressed just a little bit more, there's a nice crisp break and I was not able to detect any grittiness or sponginess to it like some other testers have noticed. It feels like a plastic trigger group, but a good plastic trigger group. And remember, we tend to geek out about precision triggers, but this is a self-defense style pistol designed for shooting dangerous things quickly and rather close. It's not a precision rifle and getting all wrapped around the axle over a pistol's trigger when most guys can't even shoot a tenth of the gun's potential is a waste of time and energy. It's just something we fret about on the internet and go out and spend extra money on to fix, but it won't actually affect the way we shoot this pistol in real life. In fact, I was able to do some surprising long range work with this pistol and its stock trigger, but more about that in just a few. One of the main complaints I hear from guys who own the Gen 2 Smiths is about their little half serrations they added to the front of the slide, presumably for press checking. We can all agree those little cuts were way too tiny to actually accomplish anything, but they made the Generation 2 pistols look better in my opinion. Well, Smith heard the complaints loud and clear and they added more of these squiggly scallops to the upper portion of the slide, not only making the pistol look really nice, but making for a solid finger purchase if you are one of those who press checks your pistol for a live round, and you should be. The takedown lever is the same as it's always been, 
But here's another nice surprise. Smith got the slide release right, something not many pistol makers have taken the time to do. Almost all of the little levers we see on modern pistols these days are actually slide stops, not releases. You can tell because they typically have serrations facing down, allowing you to easily push up on the lever with your thumb and lock the slide open manually. These thin little pieces of bent metal are almost always a bastard when you use them to try and release the slide though, because they're not really designed for it. Most manuals that come with pistols these days even advocate the use of the overhand method for releasing the slide. Smith was famous for having a slide stop lever that was nearly impossible to use as a release because it was so stiff, especially when it was new. Well, they figured their shit out, and by bending the lever just a little outward, kind of curving it here, they have now made a very easy to use slide release that is serrated top and bottom all the way across allowing it to be used as a slide stop as well. Hey, let's talk about those magazines for a second. Of course, they look just like the all-metal M&P 45 magazines, and that's because they are. Only the feed lips on the magazines are any different. The 10 millimeter magazines have a bright yellow follower, while the 45 magazines have a black follower. If you're colorblind or just a forgetful clown like me, you might just want to label the mags with their appropriate caliber even though the front of the magazines come from the factory engraved with the proper model and caliber on them. You asked, oh gee, you just showed us how the 45 is so close to the 10 millimeter. Will the 10 millimeter feed out of a 45 magazine? These are rather expensive magazines. They're not always easy to find. I get mine on gun magazine, gunmagwarehouse.com, something like that. Anyway, these are 10 round 45 magazines for the Smith & Wesson 45, 2.0. Exact same magazine body, exact same floor plate. Actually, I guess the magazine body is a little different in that these feed lips are a little wider. Will they hold the 10 millimeter rounds in a pinch if we had to? Let's give it a try. All right, 45 magazine, 10 millimeter rounds that I just dropped on the ground. Remember the 10 millimeter round, well the 45 caliber round is essentially 11 millimeters. So the casing's gonna be just a little bit fatter. Um, these do hold in there. You can see the feed lips are grabbing the 10 millimeter round. Maybe not securely. I mean, I could probably, with a little bit, with a little bit of pressure, I could probably push that up and out of those feed lips. So let's see how they feed in the gun. If I had to use this magazine in a pinch, and mind you, I'm not carrying a 45 magazine for self-defense or in the woods. But I'm just curious. That's right, I'm curious. I'm going to run a full round, a full magazine of 10s in this 45 mag to see how they feed. If they feed every single one of them, do they feed only one or two and then choke? I don't know. I don't know if those feed lips are going to hold that narrower round, that, that narrower casing. So. It's only one way to find out, and that's experiment with things that explode out here on a range. Oh gee, that's one of your stupider ideas. No, you haven't seen some of my stupider ideas. 10 millimeter rounds in a 45 magazine. Because I'm not a racist. Now I wouldn't recommend you use 45 magazines for carry or any type of self-defense activity. What? I'm also liking that hollow sun green dot. Holy shit, that's bright. Did not lock the magazine open, or did not lock the slide open. Let's take a look. We are empty there, folks. And inside we're empty. So, it's kind of to be expected. If you know firearms, you know that here on these feed lips, that little shelf right there is what locks the slide open probably on a different location than on a 10 millimeter magazine. So it fed all 10 or all 15 10 millimeter rounds from a 45 magazine. That's pretty impressive. Did not lock the gun open. Big deal. In a pinch, I guess I could use these, but I mean a pinch. Good times. One thing I noticed while testing out this new Smith, once the 15th round was loaded into the magazines, they were done. There was no possibility of getting a 16th in there, and there was no bounce or give to the magazine spring at all. 15 is your limit, full stop. 
The Smith & Wesson 10mm ships with only two magazines and this kind of sucks because I like carrying two spares on me as well as the one in the pistol. But I can live with it until they become available online. They don't offer the new magazines at first since they reserve their stock to be included with the new guns and not sold as extra gear. The magazine release isn't ambidextrous but it is reversible so if you're a lefty and God built you wrong you can easily swap the magazine release to the other side so that you can operate it with your mutant thumb. You know how Glock says never to shoot 40 caliber in their 10 millimeter pistols but we've all done it anyway because we're guys and we have to try things like that? Well I've done it for years with my Glock 20 and never once had a problem. I've shot thousands of rounds of 40 caliber through my Glock 20 despite the crying little protests of internet weenies and I've never had a problem. Well just like Glock, Smith & Wesson says not to shoot 40 caliber in their pistols but they have to tell you that. They have lawyers. I wanted to know if it was possible though and since the 40 caliber is shorter and weaker than the 10 millimeter I wasn't too concerned with blowing up my new gun. 40 Smith & Wesson Federal HST 180 grain 40 caliber 10 millimeter pistol will this even work you bet it will chamber just fine let's try them out it's actually a rather pleasant shooting gun in 40. again you don't want to load up 40 caliber in your new m p 10 millimeter and go driving through south of chicago in your raised up truck and your rebel flag flying. Made it just fine, magazine number two. But they will work for cheaper, easier recoiling practice at the range or when there's a complete meltdown of Western civilization. And the only thing being traded at the town market is canned meat and 40 caliber ammunition. Just fine. The grip texture is once again pretty rough. But I never intend to carry this big old pistol up against my skin in a deep concealment roll, so I'm not really going to file it down or anything. In fact, I found the aggressive texture to be a great help when controlling this pistol. Despite what you hear on internet forums or from those geniuses at your local gun store, the 10mm doesn't really have a punishing kick. It's more than a 9mm, but usually about the same as a 45 to most people. I have a couple little 9s and 40s that kick like a bastard, but I still love shooting them. And I found this large frame Smith & Wesson 10mm to be very easy to shoot with rather mild felt recoil. Now, internet commandos will warn you that most of the ammo you find for sale commercially isn't loaded hot. It's loaded more like 40 caliber rounds, and that's true. But I ran a lot of rounds from Fiocchi through mine, along with Sig V Crown, Nosler and the much hotter Underwood and Double Tap loads. All of them were very comfortable to shoot and I was even able to hit a steel challenge target at 50 yards with ease using the Hollow Sun 507C Green Dot. That kind of surprised me. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I've shot, uh, I don't know, I've shot probably 100, 150, maybe 200 rounds of 10 millimeters through this thing so far. It's been 100% reliable with 10 millimeter, I think, which is actually pretty impressive considering one of those magazines, 15 rounds, were fired from a 45 magazine. That's unheard of, OG. No, it's not. It's been done before. I'm going to spin you guys around. I'm standing at the 50 yard line. I lasered out one of these bad guys out to 50 yards. I'm stuffing an empty magazine here. I'm going to run the pistol with 10 millimeter rounds. At 50 yards from this point, I'm going to spin you guys around just so it's proof right here on camera that uh, this green dot hollow sun can reach out there and grab a 50 yard bad guy. Remember these bad guys that I'm shooting, these challenge target bad guys, it's only the face and the vitals right here. So if you hit steel at all, you've got a good, I hate to use the word kill shot, but you've got a good vitals hit right here in the center, not a peripheral hit out here in the goo. Uh, you've got a face shot or pretty much an A-zone hit right here if I hit steel at all. Let's give it a try. Let me spin you guys around in one take. Whoop. Camera tripod. 
I'm going to try and zoom you in. You're going to see 50 yard guy down there. I'm going to rotate you. There's that tower I shot down on Tau Flater Mouse. All right, and I'm going to start the GoPro. All right, we're already chambered up. Let's give it a try. 50 yard target. I'm going to put the green dot right on the center of the bad guy, I guess. I don't know. I don't even know where this holds at 50 yards. Whoa, we got a splash on the dirt bank behind it. There we go, 50 yards. Well, it's starting to get kind of kind of boring. boring. I'm hitting it every single time now, now that I figured out where that dot hovers. Eric Hill, this is for you, buddy. All right, cool. 50 yard target, 50 yard steel target, kill zone with a damn pistol. Now I can't do that a lot with a regular pistol and iron sights. This hollow sun, what do they call it? A force multiplier? It makes me where I can easily hit a kill zone on a bad guy 50 yards away. That's pretty damn cool. I don't know if I could do that with open iron sights, but a little green dot makes it possible. Good times. Now one of the things that I haven't seen anyone else test is the case support on these 10 millimeter rounds. Those of you who shoot 10 millimeter know that the rounds are very hot and if you reload 10 millimeter, you need to be concerned about case expansion inside the chamber. Guns like Glock have a very loose chamber and the rear of the case can actually protrude outside of the chamber mouth near the feed ramp. Tighter guns like the 10 millimeter Colt Delta Elite have a tighter tolerance Maybe they're less reliable, but they have a tighter tolerance and you'll see more case support. Basically, the steel of the chamber is wrapped up and around the base of the case near the rim and provides complete support so that you don't get any bulging down below where that uh, expansion of that soft brass happens outside of the supported area. I was a little surprised to find out that the Smith & Wesson's chamber was not only a tighter tolerance than the Glock, with less wiggle of the brass case inside the chamber, but that the chamber gave full case support all the way back to the rim, completely enveloping the brass round. This makes for a very safe gun to shoot and preserves your brass if you happen to be one of those 10 millimeter reloaders. Wow, look at the time. If you have been on the toilet this entire time, you are gonna have one red ring around your ass. Let me just wrap it up by saying this was a really fun gun. I'm very glad I got my hands on it when I did. I have a feeling that with a few more rounds through this thing and uh, tested for reliability that this could very easily become my backpacking and woods gun and replace that bulky old Glock 20. I want to thank you guys for hanging with me for this long video. I hope you really liked it. It took a lot of uh, filming and shooting and ammunition and especially a lot of editing to put this one together. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up down here below. If you're not already a subscriber, I would appreciate you reaching down and hitting subscribe and then tapping the notification bell so that you get notified whenever I put out one of my new videos. I want to put a special thanks out there to Vetter Holsters for sponsoring OG's Danger Show. And again, remember, if you guys are interested in any kind of Kydex, inside the waistband, outside the waistband, magazine pouches, or even hybrid holsters where Kydex is mounted to leather, I'd encourage you to go over, check out my affiliate link down here in the description section, and tell Vetter Holsters that you came from OG's Danger Show and that you'd like to support the show by buying your gear through them. Thanks also to my Patreon donors. I very much appreciate your guys' support. If you'd like to see some behind the scenes videos and a little extras and be included in some giveaways of some of the swag we accumulate here on OG's Danger Show, you can join us over on my Patreon page. A link is also in the description down below. Most importantly, I wanna thank all the viewers of OG's Danger Show. This channel has grown faster than I would ever expect. And I'm not exactly sure why you guys watch this show, but I'm glad you find it entertaining and informative. I appreciate you guys stopping by. You guys be safe out there. Stay armed where you are legally allowed to do so. And until the next video, OG out. <laughs>